Thanks very much, Richard, and, and to all of the panelists uh, for these excellent presentations. Um, please let's show our appreciation to them. Um, if we could have one mic uh, placed down uh, on the floor, uh, and we'll, ah, great. Um, so we're going to now have a questions and comments period. Um, one comment I'll make at the beginning is, often uh, in these sorts of sessions, uh, people feel like they need to disguise their comments as questions. You don't. If you just have a comment, comment. <laughs> if you have a real question, then address it either to one of the individuals on the panel uh, or, um, or the panel in general, and we'll, we'll try to answer briefly. Uh, and uh, please observe uh, the, uh, the time limits. Uh, we want to get as many uh, opportunities for people to ask questions as, as possible. So, Sean, uh, is that live yet? Okay, uh, so if you'd like to uh, ask a question, please, uh, please come up to uh, the mic and we can begin. I have a question for you. In uh, San Francisco and in the mission, what was the tipping point? And I feel like in Vancouver we keep waiting for, um, for the bubble to burst and I think we're seeing probably the first couple years of a longer process underway in which people really might start to question um, ownership and speculation and development in the city. But what did it really take to, to get things in motion and to get that action on the street? Well, you know, I don't, there, was, there wasn't obviously one tipping point, an accumulation of tips that happened. I think the same thing's happened here as well. How it plays out and how it hasn't. Maybe it's gelling still in terms of the Olympic Village, that development during the Olympics. Um, but in San Francisco, I think it was a constellation of a lot of different um, flashpoints. Um, I think of the, the eviction of Lola McKay, who was an 85-year-old clerical worker Irish immigrant um, who was retired and living in a four unit building. And she had a heart attack after fighting her eviction for several years. And that really pissed us off, frankly. And it, it just cut across both race and class and generational differences. Um, that was one key point. Of course, in the Mission District, I think the wholesale eviction of Latino families, um, immigrant families, and of artists, nonprofit organizations, I think was this whole series of just cumulative tipping points where, as I like to say, people started fighting like five fingers on a fist to the point of people that you would never see come out and engage in civil disobedience um, at City Hall. But I think I mentioned Mayor Brown because he brought it forward. He was like a king of the city and it was naked corruption. I mean, there was no shame in his game at all. The entire planning commission was bought and sold. We would go there and we would speak at planning commission meetings, very much similar to the development permit board here, or going before the Vision Vancouver dominated council. What was the point to email the sign up? What was the point? It was a done deal every time. And I think probably after a while, we got tired of sitting on lap committees. and realizing that was going nowhere. And we had to shake it up internally. You know, you had people that had certain zones of comfort politically in their lives, and they had never worked with SRO tenants or public housing tenants or, or uh, live work loft tenants. So anyway, I'm probably going on, on too much, but I think it was a whole series of these explosions that took place. And then maybe one little tidbit too, I think was uh, something that was kind of curious was the mission and uh, the Mission Yuppie Eradication Project. Um, I thought that was kind of interesting too when they busted out. Um, there was a, they worked with the Art Collective and the Art Collective actually had some really progressive and radical artwork that was being posted on freeways, on restaurants, everywhere that you can imagine, stenciling sidewalks. So you really had the enormity of the best beautiful world come together. Artists, LGBT people, immigrants, racialized minorities, students and women. 
those, all those forces really converged. Next question. Next question. I, I, um, I have a comment. Uh, my name's Ann Livingston. Um, the, um, the one, uh, two things. The, the um, getting organized means we need a political party that isn't going to convince us to sell out. I mean, in the sense of the cope um, vision problem that we've had for a number of years. That if we're going to have a, a civic uh, party, we need to be able to trust that that civic party isn't going to talk us into. Um, a minority council where we get to just keep going up and making presentations. And I'm not someone who's against necessarily doing those kind of things like laps and making presentations because I think it's like organizing school. I think people need to, if you, if you do it well as an organizer, you can bring a lot of people along and they become radical by their own experience of it. The other comment, and I missed one of the speakers because I was late, so I don't know if it got covered. It would appear that um, to live now in um, what we would call uh, social housing, you have to have a label. You have to be nuts or addicted or like something really wrong with you. And it's called special needs housing. And um, there's uh, people stopping me because I've worked so much with um, people who use drugs in the downtown east and have lived in the downtown east side for 18 years. Um, they're saying, Anne, I fought so hard to get in here, but it's not housing, it's a prison. I have a 10, 10 o'clock curfew and I can't have guests. And, and their tenancy issues, um, they're asking me about them and I'm not completely clear, but they seem quite organizable. And um, I just wondered if anyone had a comment about this idea that if you're poor, there's something wrong with you. Um, this, and so we'll give you housing, but it has to be this super controlled, very expensive housing, I might say, because they have a very high staffing level in the buildings. So they're basically institutions, and they're sort of the new mental hospitals. Or I see that, and I see a lot of abuse going on in them, which is really unnerving, because a lot of the workers are union workers, and I don't think they necessarily mean to be sort of um, cruel. But there's a, a tremendous problem, because they have no rights as tenants, as far as we know. Um, would, would anyone like to comment? Hi, Anne. Um, I wanted to talk about that, but I didn't really have time. But I think what we've seen recently is that a lot of the housing budget has been channeled into like assisted housing, which is actually should be under the health budget, not the housing budget. And it's absolutely necessary that we have supportive and assisted housing. However, um, it's like a shell game. And um, what's happening is that it's a cost-effective measure. Instead of paying for actually long-term health, like uh, long-term healthcare units, they're instead getting assisted and supportive housing units. And so they're trying to save money. But what's happening here is also is that these assisted living and supportive housing units, they're not covered under the Residential Tenancy Act. And um, this brings new challenges because um, the landlords, usually non-profit housing um, organizations can regulate and restrict guests as well as they can enter the rooms more freely. Uh, and I think this is something we absolutely have to address in organized tenants in SRO, in a supportive housing suite. Uh, yeah, it's uh, just a comment. It's long been my belief that uh, nothing is going to change until people get uncomfortable enough. And I've been seeing over the last six, seven years, people getting more and more uncomfortable and the development community and our government going further and further and further because they're getting away with something, so they go a little further and I go a little further. And what I'm seeing now is people are getting uncomfortable enough. The response that has to happen and the only way change is gonna happen is when we make them uncomfortable enough. That's what we have to do. We have to organize, we have to have demonstrations, we have to shut things down. We have to do things that make the ruling class uncomfortable. And until we do that, conferences aren't going to do it. It's, it has to be direct action. That's, I firmly believe in that, and I encourage people to get involved in that. And if it takes laying down in front of bulldozers, it's been done before in Vancouver, and it was successful. That's what we have to do. Thank you. I'd just like to thank you for putting this on. And uh, I'm a board member on the Downtown Eastside Neighborhood Council, and I help form a committee on homeless shelters. And I think there's been some comment about homelessness and the link to this kind of gentrification. I think it's very strong, and I think homeless shelters 
can be a missed opportunity to organize. You have people that are desperate, and if you think that eviction from an SRO hotel or social housing is easy, try going to a homeless shelter. You're forced out after a defined set of time. You have no rights. You have nobody to complain to. There's not even the pretense of an RTA and homeless shelters in BC. There's not, there's not even a legal framework by which these things are defined. And if you're a resident in a homeless shelter, you're not even a guest. You have, you have a lower form of, of rights than even a plumber that comes to your house. And the extent to which these gentrifying SROs, basically where do they end up? If they're pushed out of social housing or pushed out of the SROs, they end up on the street or in homeless shelters. And now more and more of the population of homeless shelters are really just people on welfare that can't find a 375 apartment. And homeless shelters should, they are being considered housing. It comes out of the same budget of BC housing. Ho hospitals that discharge people, they discharge them to the homeless shelter because they call that being housed if they're being returned after surgery and so forth. So we have to confront the fact that homeless shelters are being considered by the system as housing. Therefore, we have to consider the rights of people within homeless shelters as being part of this general low-income renter's rights. And another part of it is homeless shelters are incredibly expensive compared to social housing. So it's a complete misuse of public funds to create this kind of housing for people at the low end of the economic spectrum. We just did uh, Freedom of Information Act uh, requests from all of the homeless shelters in Vancouver, and some of them are as high as $140 per bed per day. They're charging luxury hotel prices to put people in halls with some 40, sometimes 100 people in one room in bunk beds. And this is inhumane and incredible misuse of funds. Another statistic to remember is we, if you just cut off the funding of homeless shelters in Vancouver at $50 per bed per day, which is still many times the, uh, the welfare portion, the, the um, rent portion of welfare, it's still three or four times what people get to find an apartment with. If you just cut it off at $50 per bed per day, BC Housing would save $8 million a year to buy social housing with, okay? And we shouldn't forget that it's the same budget. So that's my comment, thank you. I'm from the Downtown East Side Neighborhood Council, but I mean, in terms of people in the downside, Downtown East Side, I mean, they're being squeezed so hard, there's just no room margin for anything right now. It's just totally immediate. But I mean, they're, cer they're certainly want to organize, and you know, there's lots of great organizing being done, and we use a variety of tactics, including sort of militant ones, and I think everybody knows who we are, is getting to know who we are. So that's great. So that's great. Uh, we're, at, you know, we're definitely a thorn in their side, and we try and push people quite a bit. Uh, you know, so that's that's a really good starting point. But I mean, we do run into certain problems in the sense you need a, a citywide movement uh, to to succeed. And so the question being, obviously, what kinds of things can actually unite people who live in Heather Place in the downtown east side, and other and other renters in terms of a, bro a much broader and more vibrant citywide movement which has potential but it's not totally you know, off the ground in the same way. So, that, so that's one of the big problems. And the other problem is essentially there's a kind of roadblock at the, at the political level because it's basically not parties who are prepared to stand up to the neoliberal agenda whether even, you know, so that creates a whole huge roadblock in a sense where constantly running into problems with the Vision Council. City staff also, which wields a lot of power, also also buys into the same agenda, and then the, then the sort of not-for-profits buy into that, or a lot of them. So we've got a formidable constellation. And, you know, I don't think people want this. I mean, I mean, lots of people don't want this, but it's sort of posed as a fait accompli. And so the obvious question is, how do you create a much broader constituency which, you know, looks at what's needed and says, says, says a curse on all the politicians who aren't meeting their, their needs and trying to voice something on them they don't want. But that's a, that's a whole question of what kind of, a, what kind of, A, what kind of demand you put forward to unite people and what kind of uh, combination of tactics do you need. Like, direct action is great, but I mean, you do also have to have a political strategy too.
Um, I think uh, I'm wanting primarily to direct this as a semi-comment, semi-question, I'm not even sure what it is, towards uh, Patrick Richard and uh, possibly Gina, who, whom talked about coalition building, which is what a lot of the questioners, including Harold, um, have been focusing on. Um, I spend most of my, Okay. Wait, what am I doing? You're trying to shield yourself from the speakers. Oh, okay. Um, I spend most of my time sort of alternating between two forms of activism. One of them is organizing students, uh, a disproportionate number of whom um, are in, uh, in the organizing community, um, look disturbingly white like me, who are white, from middle class backgrounds or lower middle class backgrounds. Um, and then I spend sort of the other portion of my time um, as an allied member of the Downtown East Side Not for Developers Coalition uh, with quite a few really awesome people in this room. Um, and I see a lot of similarities in struggle. We're at UBC, we're currently looking at the potential complete leveling of Acadia Park, which is our last um, student family housing uh, development, and it's, it's, it's shockingly, in some ways, similar to things that are going on in the downtown east side on, on one hand, insofar as you have affordable housing that is being leveled um, in the interests of building high-rise market condos, and they're saying, oh, we're going to have a mixed housing development, and that's going to be make everything fine, and you look at the plan, and it looks like complete BS. So on the one hand, there really ought to be these partnerships, and I spend a lot of my time like trying to develop them, um, which is why, Gene, we should talk about that social housing coalition. Um, but then on the other hand, there also seem to be sort of these contradictions, and there are two that I want to sort of raise and sort of invite uh, the panelists to comment on. One um, is uh, the advantageousness of mixed housing developments and the appropriateness of mixed housing developments. Uh, Patrick, you mentioned uh, in the uh, situation with Little Mountain that the best way for the government to, um, to restore those uh, social housing, the, as social housing, would be through, would be to uh, just make a down payment on construction and then use rent from a mixed housing uh, uh, style of development to pay off the mortgage payments. Am I getting that right? Um, and I just, it's an interesting contrast with, uh, for example, zoning in the uh, downtown east side Oppenheimer district, um, where one of the main things that people are opposing is this idea that mixed housing, that putting a couple of, a few PHS units uh, into um, a condo development is the way to provide uh, adequate social housing because of course that still brings in higher income people, it still brings in more cops and security officers, it still raises land values, it does all of these things. So their mixed housing is completely inappropriate. So there's that contradiction. And then there's also, um, is the, con is, um, and then that also raises I think the question of uh, Richard that, that you're raising in terms of wanting to mix um, of wanting to really bring broad, diverse uh, groups of people together, to get multilingual, multicultural, uh, to bring in people from a diversity of backgrounds. Um, and I guess it's how do we, how do our diversity of demands, I guess, reflect perhaps our diversity of, of social locations, and how do we build a citywide movement that can actually accommodate all of that, that can include students, and can also include low-income people, can also include racialized people, can include housing for Native people, housing for people in homeless shelters, um, all this stuff. So, yeah, that's my question. Thanks. <laughs> Two big ones. Uh, one Thank about uh, forming coalitions, the other about uh, the appropriateness, usefulness of mixed housing. I, I kind of said what I, <laughs> my view about mixed housing, um, I'm, I'm actually more interested in what the other, what the other panelists have to say. I, I know that there, uh, there isn't a uniform uh, view about that, and uh, if there are um, other views about that, I'd like to hear them. Yeah, in terms of social mix, um, at CAP we're thinking that um, in 
other parts of the city when developments go in, of course, uh, poor people should be able to live in them too. Um, so mixed is okay, and people in the downtown east side should have the ability to go wherever they want. But what we found is that um, people in the downtown east side like their community, and when we asked them if you had secure affordable housing, uh, would you like to stay in the downtown east side? 95% of them said yes, because there's a sense of community, there's friends, there's resources, there's opportunities to volunteer. Um, there's a whole bunch of really positive things about the neighborhood if you're a low income person. And what happens with, with social mix is the city is using the rhetoric of social mix to gentrify the neighborhood and push poor people out. And there's no evidence that pushing low-income people out of their neighborhood is going to help them at all. In fact, it's, all t it's to the contrary. I know Elvin has some pointed me in the direction of some research that shows that um, people from a low-income neighborhood who are pushed into other neighborhoods end up doing worse than they did in the, in the low-income neighborhood because there's sense, such a sense of community. So what we're saying is, uh, don't socially mix the downtown east side because that's just a code word for gentrification and displacing people and pushing them out. If social mix is so important, then we should do it in the right place. The places that are being forced to go through social mix and gentrification are already the most socially mixed places. What's happening is the people are being taken, subtracted from the mixture. So if we really believe in social mix, then we need to do it uh, to achieve what social mix is supposed to achieve. So let's go to those neighborhoods where uh, social pathologies, the tangle of pathology, where personal responsibility and values are just really messed up. Uh, those places where huge welfare be beneficiaries, I mean, the, the, the actual tabulation of the total public commitments just in the United States, just through the federal government, through the SIGTARP, the Special Inspector General for the Troubled Asset Relief Program, tabulate of all the promises made to these welfare recipients, $23 trillion, okay? Well, so what that means is you need to go to those isolated places where all these bankers and hedge fund managers live. Now, go to the downtown east side, go to the Tenderloin, go to the South Bronx, go to the south side of Chicago. Did any of those people destroy the world economy? <laughs> There's a famous saying attributed to multiple people. There's a hundred different versions of it. When you owe the bank a hundred dollars, you have a problem. When you owe the bank a hundred million dollars, the bank has a problem. <laughs> so if we really believe in social mix, then we need to do what was done just a couple of days ago, uh, going out into, uh, it was uh, west side of Vancouver, right? Yeah. You know? West Bend. Uh, west Bend. Yes, yes. Yeah. And I read Pete McMartin's um, column the day afterwards, and it was great. You pulled out this perfect summary of the standard neoliberal justification for social mix, which is we need balance. Nobody ever goes to the richest neighborhoods in this region and says, hmm, we need balance. No, I'm sorry, you need to teach those people how to work with their hands. You need to teach those people how to punch a clock. You need to teach those people how to clean out toilets. That's a working class job. And all of a sudden now, it's like you're sending kids and you're, you know, everybody wants to become a hedge fund manager. Everybody wants to go into finance because they see it's their only protection against a future of financial insecurity. So if we really want to teach people what the real world is, then we need to teach the richest people how to work and not just make money off the section. That's the kind of social mix that we need to have. Hi. Um, my name is Stephanie, and I just wanted to say thanks so much to everyone that has been speaking and to everyone.
everyone that's here to support this event today as well. Uh, I wanted to, my, I have a question, and it's related to some of the issues that we were talking about earlier in the discussion tonight, and that's the specific situation of Heather Place and its pending redevelopment. Um, I think it was really great to outline the fact that there's a historical precedent by way of Little Mound that's been established within the city, and I think it's safe to say that that redevelopment has, is a disaster in its current condition right now. Um, and I also think it's pretty safe to say that there is fairly clear intent on the part of the city to uh, in, implement a similar strategy to Heather Place. Um, now it's been established also that the cost of repairing the units of social housing at Heather Place come in at around $90,000 per unit, which yes, is significant, but at the same time we reference things like that's not, um, that's not that big of a number when talking about the alternatives, uh, especially in terms of the actual reality of those people then being displaced and needing to find other uh, forms of supportive housing or housing de facto in other places in the city. Um, so my question is, if and when it comes, the question is more, um, is there uh, an ability to stop the actual demolition of the social housing units at Heather Place? Uh, and if yes, how, would it be possible to get those repair, repairs made in order to be able to um, stop the demolition, stop the displacement of the people that are currently living in Heather Place and um, ensure affordable and safe housing for those people in Heather Place. Thanks for the question. Um, the, the repairs are um, expensive and as Steph pointed out, not nearly as expensive as, um, as the replacement project. Um, um, in terms of the timeline and, and how, how, whether or not it would be possible to stop it, um, the, the representatives from Metro Vancouver are constantly saying, I mean, in the last two, at least uh, two, three years, at all the meetings they say, um, even though uh, the, the, the decision is coming up with the Metro Vancouver board um, and we make a decision to redevelop, that in itself isn't the final decision. And so they finally did make the decision in February and um, then went to the tenants. And then again, even after making the decision to go ahead with looking into the redevelopment, still keep the official party line, which they say over and over and over again, is that nothing is final, nothing is decided, nothing is concluded. And Barry and Tamara and other people who are at, the, at these meetings are always scratching their head because. How is it possible that you make a decision in February to go ahead with redevelopment that you're constantly, constantly telling us nothing is final? But I think to answer the question, it, that, that, um, that talking point has two sides to it. One is they're trying to convince us that because the rezoning hearing is more than 14 months away, they're trying to convince us that there's no urgency and that we should wait until the rezoning hearing and bide our time and don't organize so that finally when the rezoning hearing happens in 14 months from now, we will have not used our time to organize. Um, so it's a, it's a talking point to prevent us from feeling any sense of urgency. But on the other hand, um, it, on the other hand um, we have to recognize that um, um, what, while they, well, they're saying it's not urgent, we should say that it's urgent. But at the same time, we also have time to answer your question. There is a lot of time. The, the, there's so many factors for this project to go ahead that we should and could, and if tenants want to, can they organize and should, to stop the, 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 the flow of the process in so many different ways. There's a lot of blocks, blockage points, including, most importantly, which is the rezoning. Rezoning is a hugely complicated process. They have to convince the entire neighborhood that it's a worthwhile project. Uh, they have to make the argument to the public that it's a worthwhile project. And the planners at Metro Vancouver, sorry this, if this is a bit technical, the planners at Metro Vancouver have to convince city staff at the city that it's worthwhile. Currently, they don't believe that, currently city staff doesn't believe that the replacement had their place. They're not convinced that it's a, a project that's in the public interest. This has to be made clear, and I don't think I made it clear in my talk. The politicians, Jeff Meggs, Raymond Louis, the ones who are supported by the developers, are in favor of the replacement project. 
They're the politicians. On the other hand, they're just the gatekeepers for the entire machinery of City Hall, which is the staff, the planners, and all of them. They're not at all convinced yet. You can read a letter as recent as, I just did a Freedom of Information, I think it's as recent as February 2012, there's a letter from City staff saying, we don't believe that there's any public benefit in the replacement project. So just to give you a sense of whether or not there's any finality or, or whether it's a done deal, or whether it's, like Richard said in San Francisco, it's a done deal before you even enter the door, I don't think it is that, that late in the game, and I think that tenants can get organized and the rent renters' union is interested in, 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 in helping in every possible way to save other place. Uh, on the one hand, uh, Metro Vancouver uh, would, would like, to, would like us um, to believe that it's open. Frankly, we think they've, they've closed their minds. And, and in fact, uh, they, they sort of like you to hear, uh, bureaucracies like you to hear a gigantic iron door slamming but you know they change their minds all the time. Uh, we've we've seen them um, uh, usually to their benefit, but sometimes the benefit is that public opinion uh, has turned turned against them. Jean, did you want to? Okay, um, Jean, did you want to comment? This will be our last. Yeah, Patrick just said, well, ninety thousand is a lot cheaper than building a new unit, but. I think it, it's amazing that that family is still at Blue Mountain. And you said that there's one unit that hasn't been demolished, right? Okay, so maybe this is a lesson for people at Heather Place. It's very difficult using, uh, living in housing that's not secure, but um, if people could be organized to actually refuse to move, I think it, that's interesting. Maybe they wouldn't knock them down. Hello, uh, my name is Kim Hardy, I'm with the Vancouver Renters Union and um, I'd like to thank everyone so much for coming and uh, thank you to Barry for facilitating, excellent job. It's, it's, yes, please. Uh, it's great to have this conversation. It's necessary and it's kind of fun. Um, in closing, uh, we really hope that the impact on current Heather Place tenement tenants will be minimal. And uh, we hope that everyone here will do everything they can to uh, ensure that um, repairs on all housing should be made on an ongoing basis. Um, that's what rent is for, as Terry Martin, a very experienced contractor, pointed out. Um, renovations are already paid for in advance by our rents, so no one needs to get evicted or have their rent raised to live in better than substandard housing, including co-op residents and residents of all public housing. Um, we recognize that Metro Vancouver um, Housing Corporation is leaning towards redevelopment and uh, it's important to understand this in the context of loss of social housing throughout the city and not buy into the lies that they so doggedly repeat that they come and crash our meetings to shout out. It uh, doesn't matter how often they repeat it, does it? We, we know what's going on. And uh, we're also capable of repeating ourselves, and we will. Um, I really appreciate all the work that everyone here has already done to protect affordable housing across the city and to save Heather Place. And let's, let's continue that work. Let's be as united and effective as we can. Um, I'd just like to oops, sorry, um, issue a few reminders. Do talk to Jean about uh, forming a social housing coalition, um, and then and then do it, of course, and uh, and take a look at the uh, homeless shelter bill of rights uh, on our table over there, prepared by Roland, I believe, uh, in the green vest. Uh, as as was so eloquently said, um, 
people who have been denied the right to housing are further denied so many other basic rights, and uh, we need to stand in solidarity with them and insist that those rights are at least respected in the shitty shelters that exist. Um, and finally, we have a donation bin. It's uh, blue and it's marked donations, and um, if you can put anything in, that would be very nice. Again, thank you all for coming, and let's do this more often. Sorry, I, I forgot the kicker. We have an email list. <laughs>